There we go. Let's try this. Is this a little better? Hey. Good evening. I'm Stefan Yost. I'm the Michael and Sonia Kerner Director and CEO of the Art Gallery of Ontario. Um, we're going to have a conversation tonight between Ken Lum, artist, uh, Sophia Hernandez, Chong Kuei, help me out here, and our rap curator, Xiaoyu Wang. Um, tonight should be a lively, energetic conversation. Um, we like to start these events, and it's kind of nice starting on the fall equinox today by acknowledging that we're in the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Mississauga of the Credit. And it's also been the home to many different Indigenous groups, but particularly the Wendat and Haudenosaunee people. Um, I hope you've been able to see the exhibition. If you haven't, um, we are open till nine o'clock tonight. So um, either way, even if you've seen it, I recommend going down to the Phil Lynn Gallery afterwards to, um, to, to re-experience it or see it for the first time. Um, many of us know Ken's work. Um, and here in Toronto, I think people really um, saw his work um, through the work of Edessa Endelis in the Endelis Gallery. Um, I think she had two shows uh, of her work um, a bunch of years ago, really pretty early on. Um, but she also gave the AJO work and really kind of stewarded and shepherded and advocated for his work to go into public collections here in Canada. So I just want to kind of give a little bit uh, a shout out. Um, Ken's project here is um, the product of the Gershkin Iskowitz Prize. Um, so Gershkin Iskowitz was an artist here in Toronto. He was a Holocaust survivor, and his earliest works are um, really him processing the trauma of the Holocaust. Um, he comes to Canada and becomes quite a poetic, beautiful painter. And when he died in 1988, he gave his estate to set up the Iskowitz Foundation. The Iskowitz Foundation is kind of cool. What they do is they give a prize every year to an artist in Canada, um, often kind of people who have a nice body of work, and um, you can't apply for it. You just get a call saying, hey, you got it. And what's nice about that is if you get a prize and you don't apply for it, the CRA, the tax people, don't tax it. So that's kind of a, a really nice thing. So I just want to give a shout out to Iskowitz because. Um, we're here because of him. So um, I'm going to hand it over to Xiaoyu Wang. Yay. Hello. Can you hear me okay? Great. Thank you so much. Thanks, Stefan. Um, thanks so much for coming and to be here tonight. My name is Xiaoyu Wang. I'm the Karen Morton Rap Curator of Modern Contemporary Art here. And I feel extremely honored to have both Ken and Sophia here in this room with us. Um, uh, I would like to give a brief introduction of both of our guests by reading a short bio. Um, a conceptual artist, Ken Lum's work of various mediums use everyday objects to explore tensions between what is and what can be. With an acute sense of humor, his art exposes and challenges social constructs of race, class, and gender. In 2020, Lum was the award, awardee of the 2019 Gershon Iskowitz Prize at the AGO, as uh, Stefan had uh, introduced. It is an award that presents annually to an artist who has made an, an outstanding contribution to Canadian art. Um, Ken Lum currently is the chair of fine arts at the University of Pennsylvania School of Design in Philadelphia. He has also taught at UBC in Vancouver, his hometown, where he was head of graduate studio of, of graduate studio fine arts. He is also a founding editor of the Yishu Journal of Contemporary Chinese Art, which we will talk a little bit in later. He has published extensively. His work has been featured in numerous major international exhibitions, such as Documenta 11, the Venice Biennale, Sao Paulo Biennale, Shanghai Biennale, Carnegie International, Sydney Biennale, Liverpool Biennale, Guangzhou Biennale, among others. His recent solo exhibitions have been held at the Middleham Museum in Antwerp, Belgium, Sculpture International Rotterdam at Kruisplein, the Netherlands, and the Waddes Institute for Contemporary Arts in San Francisco. Lam has also been Lam has also been involved in co-conceiving and co-curating several large-scale exhibitions, such as the Sharjah Biennale in 2007. Sophia Hernandez Trangue is an art curator an occasional writer and a constant traveler. In January, 2018, she started her tenure as a director of Kunst Institute Melli in Rotterdam. Before heading there, she was the curator of contemporary art 
from 2011 to 2017 at Collection Patricia Phelps, the Cisneros, which has headquarters in Caracas and New York. Sophia is board member of Creative Time in New York. In the past, she has been director of Musi Tamayo in Mexico City and held curatorial positions in New York at Art in General and America Society. She has guest curated many exhibitions, for example, for the Browns Museum of Art in New York, Cadizer Foundation in Paris, Melba in Buenos Aires, and the Center for Contemporary Art in Vineyards, among other places. And she was also the artistic director and chief curator of the Nice Biennale of Mascuso in Brazil. Before that, she was also an agent for Documenta 13 in Castle. So with that, um, I actually would like to start our conversation by saying that Sophia and Ken has, have been knowing each other for a very long time. In fact, I recently learned that they met in 1997 um, through an occasion to work together for the Insights Biennial, uh, which is an international project that connects United States, uh, Canada, and Mexico. Um, why don't we just start talking a little bit about your encounters and your experience working in, with that project. And so we have um, a couple slides prepared here, uh, shows the work that can exhibited in that project. Well, I think we were uh, a lot younger then, so it's, <laughs> that's the first observation, I guess. And. Uh, and that you and, and and Sophia is much younger than me, and so you were just starting out at that point, I believe, right? Um, yes, I just counted the years, so I must have been twenty-one yeah. uh, years old at that time, and I was an intern, uh, and you were an artist, one of the uh, main artists of this exhibition, and of course, uh, our conversation began very much uh, from work that you were doing at the time. Specifically, this is one of the images mm -hmm. that you uh, had presented there in the border region of Tijuana and San Diego. And also uh, you had noticed already something that was particularly uh, associated to that context, which is in this case, Mexican or Chinese referring to the food, right. uh, but also to uh, the background of many of the people from that border region, including of my own family, you know, being right. from Mexico. Right. Yeah. I remember I teach a class at Pan on indenture history, huh? right, which is, um, quite remarkable for how few universities actually teach a class on indenture history, even though, you know, most of the world's diaspora is related to indenture and so on. But I mean, I, I have to say, uh, I and I hope you're not embarrassed by this, I thought that Sophia what, had something really special to say, and uh, you had curatorial talent. And that's why we became friends after that. I remember you were living in Spanish Harlem in New York. Remember yes. And saw you. And so I, I remember thinking, yeah, she's good. I have, uh, maybe it was out of self-interest. I think, well, when she becomes big, she'll remember me and she can support me or something, right? But I remember <laughs> that. Things turn that way. <laughs> no, but I remember, uh, in seriousness, I remember, I thought you, your perspective, where, where you came from, the fact that your grandmother was, was Cantonese, Chinese, and, and so all that. I was kind of, I'm, I've always been interested in those identities of hybridity and so on. So, and um, yeah, so I, it was no surprise when, uh, when over the course of uh, uh, Sophia's career, she ended up being director of a major museum. So. But I think that it would be nice if we talk about uh, the 1990s. Um, already Shayo had uh, proposed us to even think about exhibitions like Sidious on the Move. And I think that the 1990s was a very uh, particular time for contemporary art. It was really what we know it today. So it was not exactly the contemporary art that we had uh, thought about of the post-war uh, mm -hmm. era of the uh, mid 20th century, nor was the contemporary art of uh, when attitudes become form of the 1960s. Mm -hmm. In the 1990s, uh, when we were uh, meeting, uh, we were part of or experiencing a kind of very uh, important uh, address to internationalization that at that time mm -hmm. uh, was seen as the internationalization, particularly through the circuit of Biennales with yeah. Okwi and Wizor. And uh, well, maybe you could, yeah. I mean, you were very invested in also that uh, 
international exchange and between uh, the kind of exhibitions that were taking place uh, that had a, a kind of roster of artists like the ones of Inside, where you had Francis Alice mm -hmm. going around the globe as part of his art project. You had also uh, authors and art historians like Mi Wong Kwon that were rewriting uh, or rethinking more than anything, the histories of site specificity that had been uh, developed already since the 1970s. So maybe yeah. you can speak a little bit about the exhibition. Well, the I mean, I, I wrote a, uh, a kind of early version of a blog for um, an English um, online magazine, one of the first online magazines. Mm -hmm. It's actually quite popular. I had to write two or three entries a week, right? And uh, it's in my book. <laughs> so I, you know, I should have had my book here. I can pitch it. But, um, and, uh, but, and I actually was looking perusing it recently and realized, wow, it was such an optimistic decade, yeah. right? Because borders are coming down, unlike today where borders are going up. And it just seemed like, well, it was, it was um, inevitable, right? That, you know, the, the globalization was, a, was a, f a force for good, unquestioned force for good. And there's some naivety in that in, in hindsight, right? Because we obviously were, everyone was traveling everywhere at the time as well. And, and nobody actually uh, thought about, well, is this sustainable in terms of the carbon, uh, you know, uh, pr production from traveling and so on. And so it just seemed like everything was possible. And you're right. It was also the decade where that consolidated the importance of um, Biennales as a form, right? Because the most interesting art was actually in those contexts, right? Because um, you, you, you have artists coming from all kinds of, you know, even difficult geographies, and they have, uh, no, there's no gallery there, there's, it's, you know, it's certainly not uh, uh, highly capitalized, right, and so there was an, but they had things to say, they had a lot of things to say, because their life experience uh, was interesting to others, right, it was, um, that was important, and so um, a lot of new artists with things to say, reinvigorated the art world from at least from the capital's perspective. I also think that uh, when you look at the documents of, of that time in terms of uh, the articles in magazines or the books that were being read uh, at schools and such is that there was a lot of emphasis on the one hand first on theory so it was not just a contemporary art or visual practice a lot of it installation and ephemeral based work but also the fact of the internationalization of these biennales was precisely because it broke uh, the tradition that had for centuries, well, for a century, really, mm -hmm. only for decades, existed where the exhibitions would be organized by nation and that the selecting uh, parties would be uh, government mm -hmm. agencies or the institutions that had uh, the mandate by their governments uh, to be the ones selecting uh, the artist to go there or defining the selection processes. The figure of the curator had really emerged as a, in the 90s as a theoretician that would bring together uh, a group of artists active in, in making art and in helping co-create the uh, framework of the exhibition uh, in terms of the, uh, the focus being generally public space. Yeah, I, I agree with that because I think um, the, the um, uh, curatorial practice became its own episteme during that decade. And um, uh, you know, there was a side of it, which m maybe is less interesting is that the, the, there was a debate, I remember in terms of the, you know, the, the emergence of the curator as the, as truly the star, not the artist. There was this mm -hmm. odd debate and that, that the curator had the power and the curator was the one that displaces the artist, right? Uh, and uh, but that was a, <laughs> And so you you ended up with celebrity uh, curators as well, right? But by and large, you know the, the the these kind of old traditional configurations of how art should be exhibited as a as a group of artists, you know, according to a certain very stodgy criteria, that actually broke down quite a bit. And even when it didn't break down according to a kind of logic, it broke down because the artists who were participating for the first time in these, in these vehicles were making art that really tested all the curatorial constraints that were already in place, mm -hmm. right? That's how exciting it was during that whole decade, 
um, and so on. And I remember there was like the art school by Pontus Houghton in, mm -hmm. in, in Stockholm. Every one of them were really good artists and it was very short lived, right? As an art school, but every one of them um, became significant artists and, and transformed uh, mostly the French scene at that time as well. Yeah. I feel that, and of course, the Paris Biennale being a, 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 you know, an earlier also a project that was there. But my thinking also, if we go back to the insight, is that a borders a, were, or at least the wall had fallen in the 1990s, was very much a kind of getting to know also a, a world after the world had been so much closed during the Cold War period. Mm -hmm. In the case of the Americas, a insight really a, emerged a, not only a, as, as a kind of North American project, but at first it was a border region and the NAFTA had just been signed. So it was really Canada, looking into Canada, the, a, the United States and Mexico, and the project being cited in the border. There was a, a curator per region, right? Jessica Bradley from Canada and Sally Yard from the United States. And then there was a Olivier de Bra, uh, who's rest in peace from Mexico. But in 1997, the project uh, really uh, was of the Americas. So it brought <laughs> Latin America with Ivo Mesquita's curator. And globalization was something that was very much celebrated as opposed to now, that is something that is significantly questioned in terms of uh, you know, the impact that the global South has suffered in terms of the, uh, the economic uh, you know, pressures that the North has given in terms of the manufacturing business and others and the amount of immigration that has, has come from the South up until up to the North, uh, mm -hmm. both in Europe and in this part of the world. And now uh, when we look at the, at the work, I mean, this is the Nary, Nary Yard word, but when we look at the, uh, even if we think of the work of Francis Salis at the time, which was crossing the border, from Mexico uh, into the United States without ever crossing literally that border. So he traversed the world traveling. I mean, for an artist to mm -hmm. do a work like that, to take a, you know, three months to travel all over the world uh, to cross the, <laughs> the border, fly from Mexico down south and then arrive eventually in San Diego, sending postcards to the curators. I mean, I think that the, that the work, uh, it was, I mean, I wrote my, Mm -hmm. PhD, my PhD, my a bachelor thesis in school about this work, you know, and uh, I can't imagine that kind of work being thought today. In... I think that's true, but I, I do think it's worth um, bringing up the figure of the nomad as being this paradigmatic um, fig figure for artists at that time, which in hindsight, and I've written about this, in hindsight, I find um, a bit problematic, right? That that artists are identified as a nomad when they're truly nomads out there who move about because of penury, uh, of of privation, and so on. And 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 I think um, while your comment about you know like uh, about the borders coming down, that optimism that was true. But I also think, in hindsight, I think it was. Um, it was a, it was a different time, so I don't know if it was naivety or, or what, but um, you know, we're, we're, you know, we, we were artists were privileged to be able to go from one place to another, right? And yet somehow that, that became allegorized as um, as nomadic, right? And when you know people who are nomadic, not just I'm not speaking about Bedouins, I'm speaking about people who need to, you know leave a place because of war, leave a place because of hunger, leave a place because of all kinds of other extreme stresses, you know, that, those are the true nomads, right? So, but, so when I think back, there were so many exhibitions like the City Biennial, the title was, uh, I can't remember, Border, no, the Boundary, Boundary Riders, mm -hmm. right? And so on. So it was all this kind of idea of, you know, artists can ride boundaries and so on. Well, of course it could, we, we were privileged. Very much. I, I want to also just bring back to the artwork itself a little bit because this format juxtaposing a portrait um, with the text reappears throughout your career, can mm -hmm. like including these works you did in for insights, but also later when the later slides we saw for cities on the move, and also the new work that you're showing here, 
in the show um, time and again. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about just sort of this format you're using um, and also how this work has evolved over time? Yeah, sure. I, I, well, I first, um, my formation in art uh, started a little bit late um, because you know I, I have a science degree. I was, I was I was known as a promising science student. I was even accepted into all kinds of universities for graduate studies in chemistry and so on. And but um, and then I discovered art, um, which I recognized immediately was my true calling. And um, and so it was during the time of the of I was deeply influenced by the attendance of conceptual art. When I was a, still a student in, being introduced to art, there was a belief that, um, you know, text was the, the great challenger of, of representation during a moment of the, the so-called crisis of representation, that we need to challenge representation, particularly photographic representation, cleave it from this uh, assumption of verity and, and truth and, and so on. Right, and I and I say this, I'm thinking like, but now we're in this kind of much worse place in terms of like fake news universe and so on, right? But at that time, it was seen as like, well, you have to include text in order to defy any aesthetic emergence of considerations of beauty and so on. And so, you know, and art, art and language, uh, you know, Fox Group, lots of artists uh, believed in the presence of text displacing the pleasures of, of the image, and which was seen as somewhat dangerous um, to, uh, because of its seductive capacity to convince you of, of, of truth. And so, but I also didn't believe that entirely as well because I was of a younger generation. And I also thought, well, wait a second, text itself is also full of falsehoods and can also be used for dissembling and so on. So I was interested, and of course, it is a vehicle, common vehicle in terms of advertising relationship of image to text. It's a common vehicle in terms of name cards, a photograph of a real estate agent next to, you know, the realty company with the name. So it's that relationship is all always there. And uh, so I was kind of, but I, but I wasn't interested in uh, the supplement of text trying to I'm not sure, you know, challenge the, 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 the resonance of the image. I was kind of interested in both being um, non, um, having some non-identity with each other. And that's always true of any caption in, it, in an image is that there's overlay in terms of an, a kind of attribution, which we read as a kind of unit, but at the same time, they don't have to be, there's an arbitrariness, right? That's like going back to like, uh, you know, Ferdinand de Saussure and the, the fundamentals of um, semiotics. There's a kind of arbitrariness to the language being, uh, it's only attributed to the image because of the proximity uh, that we that we place uh, one to the other. And so I was always interested in this kind of hovering, this kind of oscillation that, and this amb ambiguity of uh, non-identity that creates a kind of tension between between the two, so, and and I find that for me it's a it's a kind of bottomless um, well of possibilities for new ideas, and so I continue to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, this also just reminds me. Um, it's very interesting to sort of witness the transition of what you and Sophia earlier were talking about the optimism towards globalization. Mm -hmm. And how you know, um, twenty years later, we're really finding ourselves in a snare of the sort of the opposite sentiment. Um, and I also feel that there is this surge of nationalism, where um, really ironically, a co-opting the language that the progressive liberal would use um, in terms of you know how we approach certain topics. It's it's the substitute of concepts, but the exact identical set of vocabularies. And I think this is really also interesting in sort of reflecting of your work where the image and the words can be serving completely opposite purpose, depending on the situation, framework, and condition. It could be propaganda or self-actualization. Yeah. Um, so I think this is also a really interesting sort of way of looking at this work. 
but, that's, um, but that's true for example if you go going way back if you look at a clock carl blossfeld picture some of those pictures look like uh rochenko pic alexander rochenko pictures and yet one is conservative working for the industry of of uh you know commodity production and the other is like this radical uh you know soviet post-soviet uh, post-revolutionary i should say soviet artists mm -hmm. right and so I, i've always been interested in that um that kind of double identity or multiple identity that can be embodied in in um in in any, any system of representation yeah okay now we're going to talk about Melly, and that's also a, the important reason why we're having sophia here with ken today um so this work called the Melly shan hates her job um which uh ken had made in 1989 and later it was included in the inaugural exhibition at what now is called Kunst, Kunst Institute de Mali in Rotterdam, formerly Witte de Witt. Uh, Sophia is now directing. Um, for me, it was a such, uh, I guess, um, the sort of a really, really great moment to see that an institution could take such a brave and courageous step. It's very radical to name itself after you know, an artwork, which can, of course, you can talk so much about um, of, of, of a figure that represents a working class person. Um, so I really wanted to hear directly from both of you of, of, of this process and also, you know, hear more about how you created work and how the whole process come along and how, you know, the, the director and community in Rotterdam landed on this decision. Okay. <laughs> I think that uh, maybe we can leave this uh, for a bit. No, this artist statement. Although I know you're. Oh, yeah, you wanna you want read this? Yeah. Okay. I think it's important. <laughs> although Ken has his uh, concerns. I have concerns because I this is from this is based on the facts before computers, and I can see several grammatical errors. <laughs> And uh, it's a fact that's in our archives uh, at uh, the institution formerly known as Vita de Vite, Center for Contemporary Art, and now as Kunst Institut Meli. And it's in the archives for different reasons, but I think that it's important to contextualize uh, this. The institution that I am uh, have the privilege of directing now has been known since its foundation in 1990 as being one of the most experimental and forward-thinking exhibition contemporary centers in the world. So it's done a bunch of very uh, radical, interesting projects depending on the time and age. In It opened in 1990 with a programming beginning to develop in 1989, and it opened in the top two floors of what was a school that was partially abandoned, a school building in the center of the city. And, uh, and the institution was called Vite de Vite because in fact, the city had an urban plan to develop the street that we're in, Vite de Vitstrat, into what was called the Museum Boulevard. So it, there's basically the Museum of the Boymans here, and they had just relocated, or they were in the plans of relocating the Maritime Museum, being such an important port city at that time, the largest one, a, right now only superseded by, by China's. So they uh, moved the Maritime Museum here, they had the Boymans Museum, which is like the AGO in Rotterdam. And in between uh, those two museums, there's a street called Vite Vitsad. And they said, if we put something here, uh, it will help the city develop better and connect better these museum spaces that will bring more to the city. So they uh, ended up calling the center uh, in 1989, just two, three months before it was registered and opened to the public as Vite de Vite. Ken uh, exhibited that first year. The director, uh, the founding director was uh, Chris Derkan. He was coming from PS1, MoMA PS1 in New York. And it's not written anywhere in the documents of the policy papers and so on, but uh, we were originally gonna be called Kunsthaus, Art House. And uh, then suddenly it appeared Vite Vitzlat, uh, Vite de Vit, Center for Contemporary Art, Punto. Um, but I think that there's a connection that we were going to a school building that was partially abandoned, that Chris Durkin was coming from working at the PS1, uh, which is public school number one, uh, now uh, affiliated with MoMA as an exhibition center, and that he came to direct the space there and brought a number of artists, including Ken Lam, 
to the program that he had uh, experienced their work in the New York scene. And um, the exhibition of Ken was a big survey that was traveling. It originated here in Canada. And, a, and we joined together with, a, with them in co-presenting the show. A, the facts comes from a, the correspondence between Ken and a Barbara, a, who was working with Chris Durkin as the production sort of make it all at the center. And a, also with an interest that Chris Durkin had that the exhibition can continue traveling within Europe because of his interest, like it was his observation in Rotterdam, this city had so many uh, immigrants and that it was one of the aspects that he wanted to highlight within his exhibition program. So Ken's participation involved a, an exhibition within the gallery spaces and also the commission of one of those works, which is Melisham Hates Her Job, which we just saw, to be actually placed outside of our building, which does not look at all like it does now. And I'll explain a little bit how, and also throughout the city. And I think that you also put some images of the city billboard. So the, uh, the artwork um, as a city billboard was, um, was uh, something that was very particular to this iteration of the exhibition. And it would be great to know what your thoughts are about that, Ken, because the question that uh, Shayal asked you first, I had actually uh, not even uh, having thought about your work so much, it is true that you've continued to uh, use this um, format so much uh, and that it makes me think also of artists such as Anka Wara, for example, that throughout time has mm -hmm. used a specific uh, way of making a work that relies in this case on an image and on a text, on his uh, a blank surface and on a date, of course, and that there's all these other stories and narratives that are there. In the case of Anka Wara, always the newspaper being packaged together with, with the canvas and the date. But in years, uh, the, the fact that the photograph uh, and the text with its typography um, always relates again to the question around labor and that there's a, always an interest to be intersectional so, the, so that the image speaks not just about work, but specifically about work and class or working class. Um, but not, not solely. Uh, so work, class, and uh, race or ethnicity is always there. And this is something that we are encouraged more and more to think about intersectionally so that we just not only think about uh, labor practices or uh, you know, questions around uh, racial discrimination, but that we think about the relationship that exists between or the so-called intersectionality between these. And so I think that um, You've done it be, before uh, since the 80s and up until now, the works that we just saw uh, here at the AGO have been taken only, uh, I mean, within, this, within the last year, mm -hmm. right? So I do think that that's interesting. Anyhow, to come back um, to that, um, Melisham Hates Her Job has been a billboard that has been hanging on our building facade or an artwork in the form of a billboard that uh, has been hanging in the facade of our building since that time of the exhibition. And on the couple of occasions that it has been removed um, because there was renovation and because of our building, if we go back to the slide of our building corner, um, it was uh, renovated. So that um, uh, all those windows right now that are of the front facade, for example, are now up into the ground. So all that white band that's there, all that concrete, is now uh, demolished and you could see immediately the gallery. And uh, I'll give a little sense of that. Uh, but when that work was removed for that uh, renovation, when it's removed because there was another artwork there at some point, people have demanded to bring it back. And by that, I mean, they've demanded on the wall and such. So it is a work that as Ken very well says, has been embraced by the city as theirs. Um, it's easier uh, for people to know who's Melisham than to know who Ken Lam is. And I think that that's actually quite interesting. She's a uh, Melisham. And I will tell you that one of the convincing arguments of using the name uh, Melisham to uh, inspire the name of our institution was um, because the institution's original name was uh, on the one hand uh, associated to the 17th century 
Vita de Vit was a, a naval Dutch officer who was even uh, very much disliked uh, or at least very much feared during his time. Uh, he was a uh, part of the uh, VOC and also as an independent uh, naval officer working uh, as a sea merchant that was associated to being very violent. And uh, he was part of the, um, of the companies that were developing uh, or really developing uh, what we know today as the enslavement of people coming from uh, Indonesia and uh, many other parts of the world. So I would say that uh, in Africa, uh, certainly going then from there to Suriname, there, there were different uh, routes, but the name had to be changed. Uh, we were not associated uh, really to that history. And regardless of the fact that we were named based on the street and not necessarily on the man, uh, the connotation was too tight. And the Netherlands has been going in the uh, going through in the last decade through a process of acknowledgement and a lot of learning of which Canada, I, I feel, is a way much more advanced as it is in Australia as well with the uh, work and acknowledgement that has been done uh, with indigenous uh, and native uh, communities, just as the galleries here, the land acknowledgement that has been done at the introduction. So these discussions really have just begun or the kinds of acknowledgements just have begun entering the sphere of the Netherlands in the last decade. When, a, when one of the participants in our working group said a, there were other options to name the space Haven, to name it CAT as in Contemporary Art Center, a Haven because of the safe space, but also because of the history of our port, it was, a, Meli was, always one name that was suggested by a number of our stakeholders. And uh, it was until one a younger person there said, all of these names are fine, but ultimately generic. But Meli is uh, the only one that if they were to rename the street, they would probably rename it after Meli Sham. So that, that would be mostly an option. And again, this comes back as to how uh, much uh, the image of Melisham as an immigrant a figure as it is in a, the majority of population in Rotterdam, which is a super diverse port city, it has taken there. Now, this is the name of our institution. A, I was explaining to an artist here earlier that a, it didn't occur to us immediately. The first time that I reached out to Ken Lam was in 2018 in December. And it was because a group a, of participants a, that uh, had applied through an open call to be parts of an arts education program developed there to actually create new stakeholders and a younger audience at our institution that was much more diverse and that had much more connections to Rotterdam. Our Contemporary Arts Center had a really focused very much on attending a much more specialized audience and the majority of them uh, to a large extent coming from abroad to see the experimental shows. So. 2018, when I approached Ken, was because a group of participants a, of a six month study program had been invited to rename that gallery downstairs to whatever name they wanted. And that we would use the criteria that they, that they used to name that space and the process and the exchanges as a case study that we could model our institution in general when we had to rename ourselves. So this was an experimental project downstairs in that gallery rather than in the rest of the building that uh, yeah that would help us think through the methodologies of how does one come up for a name of an institution um, completely anew and what is the kind of public participation that we want and so it was that group of participants aged between 17 to 24 of which one of them is here Stein Kemper <laughs> uh, who traveled uh, with me to Canada to uh, to be here and uh, and more if we if we could have, would have come. But uh, it was Stein and his group that proposed that the name be called Meli. And the reasons were several. Uh, one of them said that Meli Sham was the proto-meme par excellence, meaning uh, they, uh, or he said that, that the way in which Ken had been doing these works was how we today explore uh, through social media, uh, what we call memes that the image in the text is a overlaid or that it makes you think of the image completely different. 
Another a participant had said that her first relationship to art had been a, going with her mother to, a, to see art at a, our institution and to remember that she had a, seen that billboard and then to have a postcard a, with her of that memory. So there were a lot of connections about growing up precisely because it was a generation a, that had grown up with this billboard in the city and, a, and know that that work a, was made eventually by an artist a, can lamp had a, had a meaning to them. When going to the archives and it was Stein that when they said we wanted to call it Meli, I'm like, well, go to the archives because we don't want this, another name of the Meli, of the Vita de Vites. Let's see where the name comes from. What is the relationship? And it was very clear that in the archives, the story of Meli Sham eh, as written by Ken, inspired by his mother, eh, was quite eh, emotionally effective eh, for all of us. So Meli was a name that was provided to that space and that was inaugurated in 2018. When I contacted Ken, I said, we haven't been in touch in 15 years or so, but here I am, a, the group would like to name a, the space Meli. And Ken said, fantastic, a, which we of course love very much. And there have been many other definitions of Meli. That space a, was taken up a, by a younger and more diverse staff that we hired in this process of transformation and renaming. And that bottom gallery right now is so active and dynamic in and of itself that two years later, when the renaming came, uh, the impact was uh, that none of the names were as good as Meli was. And after a lot of debates, we ended up keeping Meli as the name because it was more difficult to create stakeholders than uh, to give an institution a new name. And uh, if the stakeholders had uh, that we had been working with and that had been supporting us in a very critical and very criticized period of time institutionally, then Meli was going to be uh, the name that we would uphold. And we did approach Meli Sham, of course. And of course, we also before approached Ken and said, really, this is a name that our advisory committee, which is external, has been proposing. It consisted of uh, Stein Kemper, Yahira Brito, uh, the artist Willem de Roy, and Elizabeth Pick, both of them who had been our board members, uh, another former board member, Case Weida, who had been involved in the city for a long time. And so it uh, people that had been involved in institutional renaming, including uh, Luis, uh, the director of Colston Hall in Bristol, who renamed uh, their institution one week before us to uh, Bristol Beacon. Um, also Colston Hall uh, being related to the same a slave history that we're talking about, but in Britain. And in the end, um, Meli Sham was named People of the Year <laughs> by the Ontario Papers here. And um, Ken, we're celebrating your award and she got a, a recognition also that I would say is quite uh, impressive. And it is very much uh, not related about hating her job. She's always emphasized that she's loved her job all the time. <laughs> Uh, and that she was a student of Ken's. Um, but uh, the reference relates to what Ken said uh, more than 30 years ago and what, um, and what I just read in the novel by Ocean Vong yesterday on my flight here and uh, what Meli Sham said a year ago in the newspaper, right? Uh, which is uh, not everyone has had the opportunity and the privilege uh, to make a choice of becoming an artist or to uh, make the decision every day to make art. And uh, that privilege is very much uh, for someone that is not necessarily uh, from a Western background, it uh, has been a few times acknowledged in so beautiful ways. And with so much, uh, as it is with your work in general, uh, there's, always a, there's always humor and lightness to a subject and beauty, of course, to a subject that tends to be a much uh, sincerely uh, dreadful, as uh, you mentioned in the statement. So I think that that the beauty of this is that, uh, yeah, is the one that we want to keep with the name of Meli for our institution. That was a fast forward. 
of no, like five that's, years that's, of that's, a that's great and story. I also just was thinking like over over all these years this work had touched so many people's hearts and it's only slowly to come to life as you know the whole remain rem, rem, renaming process and you hear these really small moments of how the work had interacted with people's daily life and I feel like this is the great power of art really um so Ken, may, maybe you want to talk particularly about this work, maybe in relation to the show that you had uh, when it was still called Bits of the Bits yes. at the time. <laughs> well, I, I mean, one one other thing that's kind of funny is that with the Bits stands translate into English as whiter than white. <laughs> and, well, but, um, no, but I, I, there's there's a lot of fortuity in t regarding uh, Melly. Like her name was fantastic. Right, yeah. this Melly Shum, it's like it's it's kind of homonym, you know. It goes if you put the S at the end, it's hums, right? There's just and then all, all, of course it's not that far from Lum <laughs> as well. And so and and so you know, I mean, what if, what if her name was like, you know, Millicent Lee? It would not work, right? And so Melly Shum, there's something about that. Um, the other thing was that. Uh, I would. I was discovering art for the really even at the end of the eighties. Uh, I was discovering art for the first time because I, I I didn't travel to Europe. You know, I never had occasion to travel to Europe um, until um, nineteen eighty five, and I was just just shy of thirty. I'd never went to Disneyland. I never went right, and so on. So I never traveled because I was always working in some crummy job flipping burgers for Burger Chef or something like that, because I needed, I didn't have the money. And so I, I was, by even 89, I was still catching up. I was still traveling. I had opportunities to travel and I felt I needed to just, and so on. And so when I went to various museums for the first time, I kind of was more fascinated by these kind of small genre paintings of, you know, like the bean eaters or, that's a well. That's a Van Gogh painting, but but of someone eating soup, you know. And I went, well, why is there such at that time such a gap between these kinds of everyday subjects that that's resonated with me, and um, and yet you don't see it in the form of contemporary art at that time. You see it much more now, but at that time you didn't. And so I kind of thought, wow, I'm interested in topics of subject formation of individuals, the tensions of, 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 you know, positionality, according to class, gender, what have you. And, um, and, and I to kind of realize that's, uh, you know, that was how my upbringing in, in, within a, at that time, a much more rough and tumble Strathcona in East Vancouver. And, uh, you know, where everybody was under stress to survive you know, um, because no one had money, right? And there's lots of street fights and things like that. And I'm not, even if I could, if I'm too small to win, right? So, so anyways, um, and so I, I started making these works, but at that time, a few people liked it, but most people also had, a lot of people had problems with it as well, that it's it's not redemptive. It doesn't have the character of, of a kind of self for which which art should have and that which by the way that was much more of a Canadian demand than any uh, than international contemporary art right the kind of Canadian definition of art was that it had to have some possibility of escape to something more positive by the by by the end of your experience of the work of art I just didn't believe that because I would I, I had a curator. I won't mention a well-known curator from one, one, the National Gallery in Canada. And uh, this curator said to me, you know, your, your work is too negative. Your work is too, it's too cold, not negative, too cold. And, uh, and I said, how so? Well, there's no redemptive possibility. And so I said, but, but I'm, trying to, I'm trying to embody or, or encapsulate my remembrances of growing up in a poor neighborhood. That's what I was trying to do, right? And so, and of course, that collided with um, with the expectations of art, at least that that was supposed to have a Canadian performance. And so, I was interested in, in these very kind of obvious ones. Like, you know, I I would 
I started, I was always fascinated looking at people. And, and you know, I've said this story so many times where I, I could be on a bus and I can see someone has a very stoop back. I'm interested in that. Not because I, 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 I I'm interested because I, I asked myself, what sort of a job has this late middle-aged person been doing that causes this to back? I'm interested in that, that finding out, right? Not finding out the answer, because I know the answer. The answer is about how people are really exploited and, and so on. I'm interested in, in a kind of aesthetic, artistic expression of that stoop back person. So that's how Meli Sham came about. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Oh, we have a very nice press clipping of him from 1990 also. <laughs> um, uh, I think this is really, we're going to skip the issue part because I feel like we have gone on a little longer, but I think this is a really great segue in, in coming to talk about the current exhibition at the AGO. I really also feel you're such a great storyteller, um, even just the way that you described how Meli Shan came along. It is a real person, but it's really very much a character. Um, and well, I'm interested in something that's plausible, not, ne not necessarily something factual. Exactly. I think there's this permeating sort of um, boundary of where fiction is and fact are, you know, trans transferring or, or crossing line to each other, where I guess to reveal a greater truth in the sense. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm actually, I, I'm, I, I would love you to maybe tell a little bit about the title of the show, uh, Death and Furniture, and um, you had expressed the interest of really kind of articulating a little bit more of your interest in, 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 in this concept or notion of, uh, or the reality of death. Sure. Well, the, the author of the title is actually in the audience, Michelle, J Michelle Jakes from um, the R R Rame, uh Museum in, in Saskatoon. And uh, she actually came up with the title, right? But as soon as she, and then she vetted it to me and I went, brilliant, that's the title, <laughs> all right? Because, because I also knew that death and furniture was actually a kind of binary term of Jacques Derrida, right? I really, I've read a lot of Jacques Derrida and, and you know, death, you know, in, in, in one of uh, Derrida's essay, he, he's very occupied by death because he said, well, death is necessary, not, not as, uh, finality, but but to prove that life has preceded it, right? So it's always the idea that you need you need death, and if you don't have death, you have no life. Life is what the value of life is through death as well, right? And so on. He wasn't speaking about regeneration and and so on. And he also spoke about furniture. He spoke about the objects that we make. It was kind of like precursor to to object theory. Um, the animate, uh, the animate animation of uh, furniture in relationship, to, because it's almost anthropomorphic relationship to the mm -hmm. to the body of the human, and so on. So it was a kind of brilliant, brilliant title. But also, I re I realized that um, I I've been uh, death has been a kind of feature in terms of my work going all the way back to the eighties, right? I mean, there's one there of the the man in front of the in the cemetery, right? Mm -hmm. And, and it, I don't usually say this, but um, that's that's my mother's grave. He's standing there, right? So, I, and then I realized that it's about a theory of my um, um, my relationship to um, to my mother was very important to me, and so on, so on, which I'm I'm learning um, in my <laughs> in my years now not to be too shy to kind of admit. Of course, it's referenced in the write ups as well. Now, this, this work was called Four French Death in Western Canada. And they're, they're made up, they're fictional, but they're plausible, right? And it came about because I was reading the uh, obituary. I like to read obituaries in the uh, Vancouver Sun one day. And, um, and there was a, and I just, I think I just come back from teaching in Paris for a couple of years. And uh, I noticed there's one death of someone who was born in France. Right, living in the Fraser Valley, and he, and he or she died. I can't remember if she, he or she, and uh, and I went, wow, okay, right. I I don't know why. I just thought like, what if there's a whole series of people? And so I was interested in migration and and so on. And when I showed them in Paris, right, I met someone from um, from Le Monde newspaper, and he actually teared up. And I 
he introduced himself. He actually teared up. And then I, I went up to him and I, I said, wow, you're really affected by the work. He goes, well, just, it's just the idea of four, four French people, my compatriots dying so far away from France, <laughs> overwhelms me with emotion. <laughs> so. So. Yeah, um, that's, that's great. Um, I guess maybe you can also talk a little bit of how, how the, how the full French death and the new Carology series related to the photo mirror. Cause that even is not directly talking about death, but there is certainly. Well, I mean, there's a lot of writings about um, photography and uh, the death like uh, past that's depicted by a photograph of a moment that's, that's died. The moment's no longer there, but it's kept in kind of, um, suspension, right? Kind of like Mao Zedong in Tiananmen Square and the mausoleum, the uh, captain formaldehyde, and so on. So, photography's relationship to death is always about a past moment can, that can never be retrieved, but can be still alive, so to speak, in a suspended sense. And so, I was interested in that. And these photo mirrors, I was also interested in um, making a portrait of someone. Right, without actually having to take the picture, right? The you know the a camera is essentially just a bunch of angled mirrors, right? Like the first camera, you don't even need a, a mirror. The camera, you just need a little pinhole in a in a room, and you've got and the light source, and you've got a camera. So I was very, I, I was very interested in in um, you know at that time not making shooting pictures anymore because as, as a series and kind of experimenting on the theories of photography itself. I have a show in New York presently. Um, so if you're in New York, go, go see it. And it's called Photo Mirrors 2, which is a, a very different kind of uh, uh, development from this as well. But they, but they come in two, two components. One is of, um, of a portrait mirror and the other of a full figure mirror mm -hmm. and so on. But I also like the recursivity that comes from viewing and experiencing a photo mirror, right? Because you also get to see yourself looking, right? Not just the, in, in terms of the mirror in front of you, but you can actually see yourself reflected from behind or from surprising angles. You can see other people being uh, called up by the mirror as they are looking as well. So there's a kind of, you know, um, infinite recursive uh, set of dynamics uh, in, the, in the overall experience of these works. Yeah, for sure. I think there is certain seductivity of being able to see your own reflection in the mirror it has to do with ego and representation. And I also think when you said beautifully about photography, it's also perhaps the death drive that we wanted to document the moment, which is a form of a memorization. Um, on that note, maybe we open it up. That's a very to depressing the... note. <laughs> <laughs> is it uh, yeah um okay we will have uh, maybe we can take a few questions um either for can or sophia if you have or for or for both of them and yeah sure uh for sophia uh, the uh, artwork that's outside the museum do you have to replace it we actually just did uh, about a month ago because it had been uh, too sunburned so the replacements no it was just there, I would like a month. So it has to re be replaced like about every three years. How often, uh, it's the first time that it's been replaced since I've been there. So I don't know, can how often? I know? don't know. Sometimes it, I've, I've seen it when it got really ratty. Yeah. Right? So, so it doesn't seem very, you know, almost scheduled according to a certain. Yeah, there's no schedule. Like yeah. uh, at the end of August, we're like, oh no, it's super uh, washed because of this very heat summer and uh, we just replaced it. So, yeah. And then you asked us for the file for something, no? And you said, it's not that big of a file. And uh, that's the one that we have, but uh, no. So it does change. Um, but why do you ask that question? I'm interested. Uh, Ken, uh, mm -hmm. how do you feel about being so, sorry? Oh, what, oh, do you ask why do I ask that question? Because it's exposed to UV. Ah, okay, 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 yeah. It was fundamental. Uh, uh, Ken, how do you feel about being having an artwork like Melling uh, defining you in, in so many ways? Defining me? You as an artist. <laughs> um, I don't think it defines me. 
I don't. So I don't understand the question. So recognizable. Oh, yeah. I'm. I. But no. But I made a lot of work, right? And uh, I think my overall irv defines me. I don't think any single work defines me. I think certain works are. All right. So. Yeah, it's like one more chapter of. I'm lucky. There's been a, a whole series of chapters, uh, not just of my art, but of my life. I feel that uh, it's interesting, right? Yeah, it's interesting. Also, it depends on the context. No, yeah. Can we give a hand to the three presenters on stage? Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Really enjoyed it. My question is. Uh, for Ken, uh, honored to ask a question. Have uh, have you ever considered creating work in different languages? Did you consider, for example, translating Meli Shum Hates Her Job into Dutch? Was there any consideration to, to different languages that you speak? Uh, and wonder if you can talk about that, or was it just, uh, you know, most comfortable in English, or perhaps maybe a uh, uh, commercial or career considerations to make work in English versus other languages? No, I mean, I think that's a good question. Um, I speak French, so I could, I guess it could be in French, but um, no, I, it wasn't shown, uh, Meli Shum was, was shown in Shanghai. And so it was in China, it was in Chinese, right? So I have done it on occasion, but, um, you know, English is basically, it's kind of a mixed metaphor, but English is, is like the lingua franca of, of it's like a global language right so that's why i do it but you know there's all kinds of interesting chinese artists german artists like Anselm kiefer they write in german right so there's no it's just that i i, I like there's something about english which which is interesting to me in relation to the question of publicity culture publicity advertising you know pop culture because my work often tries to hover in that space between low culture and the and the character of high art, right? So, and English, especially like Helvetica and so on, it's it condensed, bold, works for me in that in, on that level. We also have this in Spanish, yeah, mm -hmm. just, yeah, which is a song, mm -hmm. yeah. Hi, Ken. Um, I've been to your talks before, and you've talked about your experience one time uh, when you were talking about the furniture piece, right? The sofas. And the curator, uh, well-known curator, supposedly told you they didn't believe you, right? It was a really high end for you, but they said, it's so cheap. Like, why did you make that story up? And I think that tells a lot about the inaccessibility um, of art to a certain class, right? So do you mind talking? Uh, talking a little bit more about your furniture work in this yeah, sure. exhibition. I mean, that still animates me. It's still a salient motivator for my work, for my ideas. This, the, 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 the young lady's referring to um, a, a, a talk I gave in a certain, I, I better not even say the city. And, and, um, and the person was like a major uh, curator, um, and, uh, but got caught up in the, uh, me too movement a few years later thank god so, so, so now now that person's finished all right <laughs> all right but anyway so there is there is justice out there but so we had we had dinner and uh and he and this guy just looked at me and and i said and i went well why are you staring at me and, and he said i i don't believe you right and i said what don't you believe and he said i don't believe you when you say that you did those early you chose that furniture for the early ones, right? Because I didn't have any money. I cho chose these kind of striped brown furniture from very cheap furniture rental stores, which was actually a lot of money for me. And I said, yes. He goes, I don't believe it when you say that you picked it because you, you, your mother would like it. And, and I said, well, why is that so hard to believe? He goes, because it's so clearly ugly, right? That's a true story, right? It's quite a little bit painful, but it was, it was actually, I'm glad it happened because it was kind of a reminder of, of the, um, you know, the culture of demographics that comprise the art world, right? That the art world, we like to think that, well, if you have, there's a, we like to think of the art world as a kind of merit, meritocratic world when it's not, right? There's all kinds of, 
you know, like I didn't even know about art. There's no way I, I didn't even go to a, uh, the Vancouver Art Gallery until, you know, in my third year of undergraduate studies when I finally discovered art. Right? Everyone else were, I remember even going to an art class and some people are going, you never heard of Picasso? I said, I heard of him. Was he a, was he a painter? Right? I, right? Because if you're from a different world, you're from a different world. And so I always remember that distance. And I always remember that. Um, and that actually made, when that happened, well, I was already kind of showing quite a lot at that point, but when that happened with that curator, I remember thinking, yeah, I was on the right track with my work. Yeah, I guess it's also really interesting to think about this politics of aesthetic, who gets to define what is beautiful and what is ugly, mm -hmm. um, and how, how we actually get to get used to be trained to look and um, get used to assimilated in a way of consider things are aesthetically pleasing or what art supposed to look a certain way mm -hmm. or furniture. Yeah, and I've never believed in, I've never believed in color theory. I've never believed in, you know, I mean, I believe that some things are more, looks nicer and, and that's, not, that's not what I'm talking about. You know, but if you start traveling around and you start going to different neighborhoods, including the most disadvantaged neighborhoods, you sort of see that, you know, aesthetics, is also a cold for, you know, class divide, social divides, and so on. So I'm I'm not interested in reifying those those divides. Yeah. And, oh, go ahead, Sophia. No, I mean I, I've been thinking about this uh, um, throughout the day actually when I saw the exhibition earlier uh, today, and the relationship, of course, with the exhibition that can had uh, over thirty years ago at what is now Meli. And as I said, for me, the, the, some of the, the beauty was also like see the uh, reduced amount of uh, sort of media that uh, Ken has chosen and to insist on their generosity, like how much these works continue giving, whether it's Melisham or, or a, you know, a couch that speaks to an absolute truth. Um, but I also feel that uh, that the to a large extent the uh, that Ken Lam and this is also to respond to some of the things that I heard whether it's the disbelief of artistic intent or biography or a choice of of taste you no know? uh, or whether one work makes it or not uh, the persona I think that one of the things that uh, for me uh, Ken has has become representative of is a, is an artist as a, a you know as as an intellectual and that an intellectual doesn't have to be an academic that an intellectual doesn't have to mean conceptual art in the strictest sense of of the document and the a, the tautology of it that a, that work that is intersectional or about race or identity and subject formation doesn't have to look a certain way, which is the expectation around figuration. So to me, there's something uh, that, uh, I mean, I think that the artist as an intellectual and the artwork as a gift, which is, you know, uh, a strong idea that has been reverberating is really what uh, Ken Lam's work passes there. And we haven't even talked about the fact that you're related so much to the Vancouver conceptualists and photo conceptualists. And uh, I mean, there's so many ways to go into thinking of your work and the practice and of course, issues around class. And, uh, but I really think that it's so simple. Like when, when the young man arrived here to give you a letter or something, you just open it and you said, oh great, you know, a letter that I've been uh, what did you say the, the word? I was, I was making a joke that it was a summons. But he, he was so serious, like, oh, great, a summons. And I'm like, what? You've been summoned? And he's like, then I'm like, what? But you said it so seriously in a <laughs> deadpan way. And I'm like, oh, no, it is true. Uh, and uh, I think that, um, and then you laughed. And I'm like, okay, this is part of the, of a, that's in the work as well, like that instant or that moment of, whether it's belief or disbelief, but for sure that a, that the artwork can take you anywhere, right? And I think that that's that's really the beauty of of the simplicity of a, a materials, and of course the the theory of the monuments that you've uh, 
that you've developed in a, in the late years. So, well, I, I appreciate that, but I, I do think um, the, the person who asked the question about the curator, you know, I think back and it was like another instance of um, of a kind of uh, you know privilege. The, he he is white, so it's like a white privileged containment of someone who wasn't white. I think there was some degree of that, you know, and because I've experienced that as an artist throughout uh, my career, much more so earlier on, especially earlier on, there was a real sense of, of that I got, you know, of uh, what, what now is called microaggression of, you know, you need to be put in your place. You're, you don't, you know, you're, you had to, you're wearing your ambitions on your sleeve, which was also seen as um, uncouth by, by Canadian standards. Uh, yeah, people would ask me when I was a young artist in, in Vancouver, um, you know, I'd say, I'd say, I want to make it big. I want, not big in the sense of, I want to be a big star in the art world. I want my work to have an audience. I feel I have something to say. That's what, that's always been my ambition. I want to make the best art. But people are always, not all people, but enough, especially people in, institutional settings who are going you know we need to contain this mm. this kid and so on um yeah okay i mean i that's really great and i i really i i feel very grateful to hear all this and you being so genuine about the, these experiences because uh, I I totally believe you. <laughs> um, so we're going to take one last question, and I think we're already running over time. Uh, yep. Uh, thanks, Kent. Uh, your work has been provocative, so I'm going to ask a provocative question, if I may. Uh, look at your necrology and the obituary. It's really uh, mind-blowing. It's imaginative. Get out of your box. As you say, it is uh, possible, not factual. So I'm going to turn it around with artistic license. At the same time, I went to see the uh, in-house Faith and Fortune, the, the Spanish global empire. And Spain was the first global power at the same time with the Dutch empire that Sophie mentioned about Indonesia and the Dutch is in their company that involves in colonization and enslavement of Indonesian people. I'm from that part of the world, Southeast Asia a former British colony. So um, these days, uh, we pay much attention to the passing of the queen and all the outpouring of uh, love and sympathy and whatnot respect. So that is the mainstream obituary. But I'm flipped and think, if it's me or you, what kind of obituary you will write for this queen of Canada? <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't quite catch it, I'm sorry. Uh, she's asking what kind of obituary you would write for the queen. Obituary. Yeah, yeah. I have my own version. The flip well, I think the best obituary was written by the Beatles. She was a pretty nice lady. And uh, it was a very short ditty and at the end of a song, right? That's, and that's, you know, I think I'd try to write something, but I can't. The Beatles wrote the best uh, obituary. It wasn't an obituary, right? But, you know, um, I don't know. Um, I'm not, you know, I, I sympathize in the sense that it's the death of a of a person, of a mother, of a right. But um, I don't, you know, I'm going to get myself into trouble. <laughs> I, <laughs> I don't, I don't have any uh, feelings in terms of her death. Otherwise, outside of that, right? Because I, I don't, I don't believe in the royal family. <laughs> I don't believe in, I don't, you know, they, they their apologies came really late, and. Um, and they maintain a very uneven empire, you might say, the white-skinned empires and the darker-skinned colonies, and so on. And so, but I, I, I mean, I feel sad that you know any mother, and I'm sure that they evoke sadness for a lot of people, right? So that I can, I can sympathize on that level. Okay. Well, thank you so much for coming, and thank you for staying through the Q and A. And we look forward to seeing you next time at the AGO. Thank you. Thank you.